guys heard the new Linkin Park song? Now, I remember, and everybody knows this, but yeah, of course, Chester Bennington tragically uh, took his own life uh, about seven years ago. And um, it shook the freaking music world by storm. Um, Chester Bennington was such uh, a talent, just filled with um, emotion. And uh, I think when we lose artists, uh, you know, musicians, often if they're the singer and if they write the lyrics, oftentimes we go back and we, we, we listen to the songs again, you know, and we listen to the words. And when I listen to a lot of Linkin Park's music now, after he died, man, those, those lyrics really jump out at, at you. Like, like what I've done, you know, uh, faint and, um, somewhere I belong. And I could just go on and on and on. It, it really just hits you the pain and the suffering this guy, uh, went through. And, uh, it, it's like the songs take on a whole new meaning because before he died, it was more of a universal appeal and things that we can all relate to. Right. But after he died, it became much more uh, personal towards him. And I think there's still that universal quality there, but, but man, I think the songs take on um, a bigger meaning now. So it, it reminds me of uh, this documentary on Joy Division. Joy Division is one of my all-time favorite bands. And um, in the, the documentary is so great. I think the documentary is just called Joy Division. I highly recommend checking it out, but it's just interviews with the three remaining members. And Ian Curtis took his own life uh, back in 1980. And the their second full-length album came out like, I think it was uh, maybe a month or a couple months or something like that after he passed away. And it was called Closer. And... Um, yeah, that's Liana. That's the one I'm talking about. The Anton Corbin, uh, and also his mo the movie Control. Oh my God, that is my all time favorite biopic. I'm a little biased because I'm such a Joy Division fan, but it, even if I wasn't a Joy, Joy Division fan, that biopic is it stands out among all other biopics. It just has a different flavor. It's in black and white, which is cool. And I think Joy Division's story is very different than most bands. You know, uh, that that whole um, British new wave mo movement some would say joy division created new wave uh, i think they did i really i'm sure there were some influences before but if you listen to um um their what they were originally called was warsaw same band same members but they changed their name to joy division but it's also it's it's almost like they changed their style when they became joy division could because warsaw and joy division sound like two completely different bands warsaw is more straight up punk joy division is um, uh, more of like a, a goth, uh, just very emotional, moody music. And that's because of the, the pain and the struggling that Ian Curtis was going through at the time. And uh, just to relate this to Chester Bennington, and they talk about this in the documentary, after he died, um, the lyrics, like uh, one of the producers was uh, stating, um, you know, I take the blame. He was talking about how um, that was one of Ian Curtis's lyrics, you know. Um, one of my all-time favorite songs, by the way, um, New Dawn Fades. What a freaking song, New Dawn Fades. Jesus. But, uh, and he says, I took the blame. And after he died, uh, you know, his friends, they were like, oh my God. He was trying to tell us all along. It was like, some people, they can't convey the pain that they're feeling Unless it's through their art. And that's what Joy Division was doing. That's what Ian Curtis was doing. He was, he was, it was almost like he was crying out through his lyrics in his songs. But the rest of the band, you know, they were all young, right? And they, they thought this is just art. And then there's a lot of uh, musicians that have these types of lyrics that are in that specific subgenre, right? Like freaking um, um, The Cure. You know, the, the lead singer of The Cure. His lyrics are very dark, very heavy. He's still with us. I'm, I'm not saying he didn't feel those lyrics that he was saying, but I think for a lot of people, uh, taking one's own life, maybe it's not an option. You know, maybe they're like, I, the way I can 
get this out of my system is just um, venting it through my art, through my music, right? And um, Ian Curtis, unfortunately, he wasn't able to uh, beat those demons, right? And so it's that's one of those deaths that still hits me to this day. And I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of Joy Division for most of my life. I just, I became a Joy Division fanatic after The Crow. After I was obsessed with The Crow, and then I found out that James O'Barr was highly, highly influenced by Joy Division for that movie. Then I was like, ooh, what is this Joy Division thing? And I went down the Joy Division rabbit hole, and I became, like, obsessed and intoxicated. And I went through a phase where I was like, that was all I was listening to was Joy Division. And uh, it got quite depressing. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Their, their music is phenomenal. But you have to be in a certain state of mind to listen to it. Whereas, jumping back to Linkin Park, Chester Bennington, he, he made um, um, therapeutic art in more of a commercial way. Right, a, a lot of Lincoln Park's songs are much more accessible to the masses and upbeat, and that's definitely not a slight. I put Lincoln Park above just about every band that came out of that movement, except for maybe Deftones, you know, um, of just offering something else, something different than what the the normal new metal band was was offering at the time, and I think. Lincoln Park and especially Chester, I think they got like um, fed up with that sound. And that's why they changed their sound, um, you know, the third album in. And, and, and um, Minutes to Midnight definitely still, it's like a nice segue between what they were and what they were going to become. Minutes to Midnight is kind of that bridge. But um, yeah, they made the music they wanted to. And I tell you, Lincoln Park lost a lot of fans, uh, at, uh, th you know, four or five albums down the, down the line. And, um, I remember like even friends of mine, they were, they were stating that, man, I wish they would go back to like their hybrid th theory and, um, Meteora, which by the way, Meteora is a freaking masterpiece of an album. Um, and I'm not going to lie. I probably felt that a time or two, um, when those albums came out, but now kind of looking back on it and I, I can kind of compare this to my my love for silver chair right and silver chair very similar story daniel johns um he he hated the 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 movement of music when they came out especially in the early 2000s after their third album was out and um their first two albums are very similar to what lincoln park's first two albums are it's a different flavor for sure, but they're both pretty much straight up rock oriented, you know? And Daniel Johns, um, he, I think you can kind of compare Minutes to Midnight to um, Neon Ballroom. Both of those albums feel like a bridge and they're really great albums, but they just feel like they're a bridge to something else. So Silverchair, when he, when he did their fourth album, Originally, they did just more of a rock-based album, and I mean, he did 18 months of work on this album, and he was highly influenced by like Caius, right? That was one of his like main influences was the band Caius, and uh, he kind of had a panic attack, and he was like, "Oh my God, I don't want to put this out because if I do this, that means I'm pigeonholed, and I have to stay in this lane for the rest of my career." And uh, so, you know what he did? He freaking hit the delete button and, and erased the tape. 18 months of work. Erased the tape. He bought a piano. Had no clue how to play piano. This is, this is amazing to me. And he learned by ear how to play the piano and wrote an entire album on piano and created what I think is a freaking masterpiece of an album. Um, uh, di diorama. Diorama, sorry. Um, that album, man, there's so many flavors in that album and every song is phenomenal, but different from each other. There's some rock stuff on there, but there's also um, um, some more experimental type music. Uh, just what, what a great album. So I know I'm, I'm all over the place with my thoughts on this, but that's just kind of how I do things when it comes to music. It's hard for me to stay like uh, focused 
with, with music because I love music so much. It means, it means it's one of the most important thing in, things in my life. You know, I've been a musician, my, uh, you know, a drummer since I was 12 years old, you know, I'm 51 now. So, and I love all different types of music. I, I think that's one thing about drummers is we tend to like just about every type of music. We can find some value in just about every type of music. So, um, but yeah, jumping back to Lincoln Park, they got a brand new singer, um, Emily Armstrong. And there's all there's already some controversy, but I, I'll say my thoughts on the new song. I loved it. Loved it. They're definitely going back to their um, original sound, um, which is cool. I think that was a... a um, uh, a strategic move, right, on Mike Shinoda's part, because we're bringing in this new lead singer. We don't want to, um, we don't want to load up our audience with a new lead singer, and then oh by the way, we're going to completely change our music again, right? No, let's kind of gi let, let's give them some uh, something that's more familiar. And of course, I haven't heard the whole new album, so there might be a lot of experimental stuff on the new album. But this particular song it feels like old Lincoln park. And, um, I think going with a female lead singer was kind of a stroke of genius. If, if I'm being honest, uh, who can, who can scream? Like, I think she's got a really great voice and she can handle, um, a, a lot of their earlier songs because Chester could hit some very high registers in his voice. And I think some of his, um, and I'm no like, you know, expert when it comes to vocal arrangements and everything, but, you could see a female um, singing some of Chester's work, though you know he because he had such a unique voice. So I think yeah, I think she was a great pick, uh, and I'm very very happy. And I'm I'm curious, but yeah, there was some controversy because of uh, Scientology. Look, guys, and I know this is controversial. Believe what you want to believe. I, I saw I already saw some people on um, Twitter saying. No, this religion is a cult, and this religion is not a cult. This is the real deal. And I think when you do that, you start getting yourself in trouble because then you start putting your religion above someone else's religion. And um, to call anybody's religion a cult, because people that are extremely extremely religious, like I, and, and being from the military, I, I, I had so many different friends that were from so many different walks of life. And that was really eye-opening to me. And uh, one of my best friends when I was in the military was Pagan. And um, he was the coolest motherfucker uh, I've ever met in my life. And um, yeah, I think, luckily, I'm a very open-minded guy. And I'm not overly religious. I'll put that out there right now. I have my own personal religion. But like I said, I'm not like... You know, I'm not going to come knocking at your door. Okay, let's put it that way. But for for anybody to put their own religion above anybody else's, I don't care what the religion is, even if it's Scientology. It's still just and and people that are Scientologists, I'm sure that they could look at like say Christianity, and I'm not singling out Christianity. I'm just picking if they call it a cult for whatever reason. Are they wrong? And I don't believe it's a cult. I don't believe Scientology is a cult. What I'm saying is you can cherry pick different attributes of pretty much every religion. And it might feel very foreign to you if you're not, say, Christian. And we, we often put down what we don't understand, right? Like that can't be right because what I believe is right. So I'm going to call that a cult. And I, again, I think that's when you get yourself in trouble. And I think it's stupid to call it whatever. I don't care what you believe, right? So I know that they tied her to Danny Masterson. She was good friends with Danny Masterson, I think. She put out a statement. You can go find it yourself, stating that basically she was supporting a friend at first, and then when, but she didn't know what, you know, how guilty he was. But as soon as she found out about that, she she took a step back and she said, okay, I'm, I'm done with this. He's on his own. All right. Um, but you can't take like you you can't take one person from a, one religion and compare them, like give them the sins of another person, right? Like say Tom Cruise. 
like uh, some guy on uh, one of the guys I was talking to online that called the, the religion a cult. And, uh, you know, I, I would never support this person. Uh, and so my answer to that was, what's the last Tom Cruise movie you saw? I don't know the last movie, the Tom Cruise movie he saw. Maybe he's never watched Tom Cruise. But if, if, if he told me that the last Tom Cruise movie he saw was probably three, four years ago, I wouldn't be surprised. So don't, I don't think you should pick and choose your, um, your, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, your criticism, I guess, over any religion. All right. So, yeah, I don't talk. I, I really don't talk about religion. It's like Chris there. I keep my mouth shut about religion. I, I, I don't bring it up on my channel. I don't bring up politics on my channel. I think the, the whole thing is uh, it's a very personal thing. And um, I mean, even politics, guys, it's weird to me from a, like a social angle. Like uh, it's kind of like religion. My, 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 you know, I'm Republican and I, I, I feel like I'm better than you because you're a Democrat and, be, and because you're a Democrat, I want to think of you as the worst piece of shit on the planet, which is very strange to me. And by the way, that's not something that really existed to this level even 10 years ago. But for some reason, now we've all taken a side and we got, we got us, we only have to, um, stay on our religion and people are freaking losing family members over this shit, which is weird to me. It's weird. Support whoever the fuck you want to. I don't care. You know, I'm sure that Republicans have some things that are pretty admirable. And I'm sure that Democrats have some things about them that are admirable. I step back from it all. I don't give a fuck. I, I don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I'm so much more into so many more things than religion and politics. Luckily, there are some people and they wake up every day and that's all they think about is their religion and their politics or both. And um, I'm just not that way. And if you are that way, God bless you. But just don't be mean to other people. That's all I'm saying. Right. That's all I'm saying. Uh, Lori Ann, channel member. Thank you, Lori. She says, religion and politics are two topics I do not engage in online or family discussions about. And the reason she doesn't do that is because she's smart. Because you can't win. You can't go back and forth with somebody that is just locked in, right? You're locked in to your belief and you can never be swayed the other way. So why even go down that road? You know, it, it makes no sense. What's up guys? You are at the end of the DD Live clip. Uh, what I do is I like to clip these out if I think the, the topic is important or something that's newsworthy. So. Thank you for watching, and uh, if you want to watch more, you can you can go over here, you can go over here, click on one of those, and uh, yeah, and uh, hopefully I can do this for 20 seconds, which I think I did. Okay, so yeah, thanks for watching, guys.